we begin Psalm 135. You may recall the last time, just to warm us up, we were together. We had the culmination of the Psalms of Ascent. It was only a three-verse psalm. It's as follows. A song of ascents. Behold, bless Adonai, all servants of Adonai, who stand in the house of Adonai in the night. Lift your hands to the sanctuary and bless Adonai. Adonai will bless you out of Zion, maker of heaven and earth. And that was the culmination of 15 psalms that had this quality of pilgrimage and a focus on Zion. In those 15 psalms, the word hallelujah, praise be Yah, does not appear. Here in Psalm 135, hallelujah is the opening and the closing of the psalm. And hallelujah, a word that appears 24 times but only in Psalms, in Tanakh. Hallelujah here distinctly will also be not at the beginning or the end of a Psalm, but in the middle, verse 3. Hallelujah. And yet, Psalm 135 is linked to those Psalms of Ascent in that you'll see the opening of the Psalm finds us at the temple, at the temple mount, and a call on those ostensibly who serve God, the Kohanim and the Levi'im, to praise God. And where in Psalm 134, the closing line was, Yevarechecha Adonai Mitzion, God will bless you from Zion. Here, the close and it's a longer psalm, 21 verses, is Baruch Adonai Mitzion. Blessed is Adonai from Zion. So we're still linking ourselves to the temple, but this psalm, Psalm 135, is calling on the people to praise God. It'll begin focused on those who seem to serve in the temple, and by the end will ask all who are gathered, house of Israel, house of Aaron, house of Levi, all who fear Adonai, building to a crescendo of let us praise, that tomorrow, actually not tomorrow, week after next, but Psalm 136 will be a kind of continuation, but also distinctive, where it will be a call and refrain in Psalm 136, Ki liolam chasdo, for God is a God of kindness, let us praise God. There's even a debate, and it's always a debate, in the Talmud as to whether 135 and 136 should be together collected because they both deal with recounting history and praising God into one to be called the great psalm, Hallel Hagadol. But ultimately, the debate in the Talmud in, Ta in Psachim 118a goes unresolved. But in the Code of Jewish Law, in the Shochan Aruch, it'll only be one. 36 that gets the title the great psalm but that's only to say there's a lot of overlap and yet distinctiveness last comment before i read the psalm psalm 135 is all quotes or images from elsewhere in that regard there are some distinctive elements like that repeated hallelujah in the middle but what's most distinctive is that it's almost all paraphrasing and quoting and conjuring of images of the past it's like a montage of moments that seek to describe god as creator 
God is Redeemer, and God who is not like their gods, not an idol. Those things are not original. And so every verse has a correlate, and yet there's a feeling of flow. By using images of other psalms and other parts of Torah, there is a sense of harvesting the past, linking ourselves to continuity, as in this moment, we become aware of God's presence and we are called to praise God. Hallelujah. And so with that, Psalm 135, I'll point out after reading it some of the variations in translation, elements of um, the flow, and look to conclude with how, of course, are these words relevant for us. Halalu of Dei Adonai, verse 1, provides the title. Praise, servants of Adonai. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Adonai. Praise, servants of Adonai, who stand in the house of Adonai in the courtyards of the house of our God. Hallelujah. Kitov Adonai, for God, for good is Adonai. Him to God's name, for it is pleasant. For Jacob was chosen by Yah, Israel, for God's treasure. Ki ani yadati, as for me, I know that great is Adonai, and that our supreme is beyond all gods. All that Adonai desired, God made in heaven and on earth and the seas and all depths, ascending clouds from the ends of the earth, lightnings for the rain God made, bringing wind from God's storehouses, who smote the firstborn of Egypt from humankind to beast, sent signs and wonders in the midst of Egypt against Pharaoh and against all his servants, who smote many nations and slew mighty kings, for Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage for Israel, God's people. Adonai, your name is forever. Adonai, your remembrance for generation to generation. For Adonai will judge God's people, and upon God's servants will, God, will cause comforting. Idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. A mouth they have and they do not speak, eyes they have and they do not see, ears they have and they do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. Like them shall be those who make them, all who trust in them. House of Israel, bless Adonai. House of Aaron, Bless Adonai, house of Levi. Bless Adonai, those who revere Adonai. Bless Adonai, Baruch Adonai Mitzion. Blessed is Adonai from Zion, Shochen Yerushalayim, who dwells in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Now, to go back through the psalm and analyze some of the artistry and the message that is conveyed in the structure, God is the key focus. Praise for God. The name of God and variations of the name are reoccurring. The name of God is repeated 21 times plus 17 pronouns for God. In that sense, this psalm of 18 verses is of 21 verses is, you know, 21 verses and 21 times God's name is, is, is said. And is said in a variety of ways. yud heh vav -Hey, most commonly, and as in verse 1, Eloheinu, 
in verse 2, Yah in verse 4. So there are different names for God conveying, if you will, that God cannot be named and that God is present in many, many ways. There's also an interesting play as I begin with verse 1. The focus is on Avdei Adonai, servants of yud heh vav -Heh. And that word servant will appear again here in verse 9 to refer to the servants of Pharaoh. There are servants of God and there are servants of human kings. Here the message is God is supreme. God is unlike human kings, even though there are those who would serve kings as if they were gods, just like there are those who will worship sticks and stones, idols, as if they were God, but there is only one God. Now, I mentioned that every verse of the psalm is an echo, but is a little different, except for a few quotes, to previous psalms. So take verse 1. If you look at Psalm 113.1, you get the same words, but it's hallelujah of the Adonai and then hallelujah shame Adonai. So it's flipped. It's praise servants of Adonai and then praise the name of Adonai. And so when, as in every verse, there are echoes of other verses of Psalms or scripture, clearly there is intentionality to how this artist, this poet, is composing the psalm to convey a message. And here the key message, and maybe why it's flipped, is the key message is praise the name of Adonai. All the more in that that phrase appears in elsewhere in Psalm 113.1, the choice of praise the name of Adonai as the first statement conveys what the point of this psalm is. And here, verse 2, who is it that this poet, this psalmist, potentially a Levite, is addressing? It could be those with whom he works, all who stand in the house of Adonai. So not unlike the Psalms of Ascent, we now, with Psalm 135, still find ourselves at the temple in the courtyards of the house of our God. A little bit about the imagery to allow ourselves to be in the place of the poet. In the temple time, first temple, there was, if you will, concentric circles. There was the tabernacle-like, the part that it would be entered into only by the priests, but outside there was an altar, a public altar. And there near the public altar was a courtyard, but that courtyard was just for men. There was another, another courtyard adjacent to us, to, to it, to its east, and that was for men and women together. So there was a series of courtyards, and in the courtyard, the Levites seemed to be standing on risers so that then the people could see them as they sang, as a focal point of celebration. And so here, the psalmist <clears throat> could be addressing those Levites in the high rises, saying, you who stand in the house of Adonai, in the courtyards of the house of our God. And then this distinctive, verse 3, Hallelujah! Praise be Yah, for good is Adonai. Now, not to move too fast from verse 2, others will say, who stand in the house of Adonai, like Rabbi David Kimchi, that important 
psalm commentator, Bible commentator of Provence of the early Middle Ages. David Kimchi will say that the first part of this refers to his colleagues, and then the second part in the courtyards of the house of our God, because it's in the plural, courtyards, refers to all the people in the diverse courtyards that constituted the temple. When it says, him to God's name in verse 3, for it is pleasant, it's not clear what the it is and who exactly. Here is some ambiguity. Is it, as Richard Levy would say, part A is, for, it, for good is for Adonai for us to praise, and it is pleasant also for us, we who are doing the chanting, to praise God's name. And the it is, according to Radak and Ibn Ezra, classical commentators, referring to the name. And now it continues. For Jacob was chosen by Yah. That is another name for God. It's the end of hallelujah. The word yah for God is like breath. There's even a dot in the hay. In biblical Hebrew, that's called a mapik for breath. Yah, it's an added breathy sound. For God was chosen by yah, if you will, the source of breath, Israel for God's treasure. And that treasure, segulato, is suggestive of Exodus 19, 5, Deuteronomy 7, 6, Deuteronomy 14, 2. The sense that Jacob is a special relationship with God. And again, this is in the context of temple. Those gathered in the place that's identified with a particular relationship with God. As for me, I know that great is Adonai. This is the one time, verse 5, where there's a shift between talking to the people and talking about God where it's personal. Now, the word ani is superfluous. It could be ki yadati, for I know in Hebrew. And again, it's poetry, and words are purposeful. So the addition of the word ani is emphasis. And this is a turning point, verse 5, to say, let me testify, let me witness. I know that great is Adonai, and that our supreme is beyond all gods. And that will be now the key theme. How is God beyond all gods? Mikol Elohim. Now, the word Elohim is used in the Bible with a small g in translation for those with authority, judges elsewhere in the Bible are called Elohim. Classic commentators, Rashi, Radak, will define this as the celestial helpers, that God is not dependent on the angels, also called Elohim. God, what we're going to read about now, we know is your efforts. God Verse 6, all that Adonai desired, call asher chafetz Adonai asa, God made, God did. God can do whatever God wants, is verse 6. In heaven and on earth, in seas and all depths. And here there are, as in the creation story, three planes, sky, earth, and water. And so God encompasses 
all of creation. Here's, as is often the case in poetry, a, a rare word, nisi'im, verse 7. Ascending, nisi'im means that which goes up. Radak will translate it and explain it as clouds. Others will translate it as vapors. From the ends of the earth, lightning for the rain, lightning because lightning is often identified with clouds and rain together, bringing wind from God's storehouses. And that image of the winds being brought from storehouses is in Job 38, 22, Jeremiah 10, 13. It's in Greek myth as well, the Greek myth of Aeolus, where the Greek god kept winds in a cave. And so here is kind of archetypical imagery of God's power over the heavens. But it's also to say that God is active. See, in verse 7, it's not like in verse 6. It's not just about creation. It's about ongoing engagement. We have in our prayers, we say every morning, as part of the Yotzer, the prayers of creation before the Shema, who mechadesh et kol yom tamid ma'asei vereshit, and God renews each day per perpetually the works of creation. And that's the sense of verse 7. God as creator is actively engaged, and not just in nature, but in history. Now, verses 8 and 9 focus on that key act of liberation, who smote the firstborn of Egypt from humankind to beast, sent signs and wonders in the midst of Egypt against Pharaoh and against all his servants. Two things to note. One is it's the tenth plague that's mentioned and only it distinctively. And then the nine plagues are kind of all in verse nine. It starts with the tenth plague to suggest uh, Ibn Ezra will say it's singled out as the ultimate plague that broke Egyptians will. It's the convincing culminating plague and then everything is subsumed under that. But God not only had the power to enter into history to liberate but to allow us to enter into the land. And I will pause to acknowledge that what is missing here, and tomorrow, Psalm 136 will also be a survey of history in the Bible, Mount Sinai is absent. Why? Not so clear, but perhaps because Mount Sinai is placing demands on Israel to enter into covenant. Here, this Psalm and Psalm 136 is simply a description of what God did for us. No conditions, no expectations. This is how powerful and good God is. And now verses 10 to 12, a description of the entry into Canaan, who made many nations and slew mighty kings for Sihon, king of the Amorites, and O king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage for Israel, God's people. Rashi will comment that there are 31 kings mentioned in Joshua's conquest in chapter 12, but these two get singled out, Sihon and Og. Commentators will suggest a variety of reasons. They were known as giants. They're archetypes of power, but more. They were the two kings in Numbers chapter 21 that the Israelites asked to pass through their land on the way to Israel in peace, and they rejected that offer of peace and attacked Israel and were defeated. And so they become the archetype of those on the way that God defeated on behalf of Israel and gave their land as a heritage. Now, initially in my own translation, I use the word possession for Nachala, but I ultimately 
chose to retranslate it as heritage to convey what continues, and that is from generation to generation, which is the theme that now unfolds. Adonai, your name is forever. Adonai, your remembrance from generation to generation. And now the first quote, outright quote, for Adonai will judge God's people and upon God's servants will cause comforting. Here's what's dramatic about this as the first outright quote. Verse 14 points to the future. It's not what God did, it's what God will do. And it was said by Moses, chapter 32, verse 36 of Deuteronomy, as Moses, in the last few chapters of the Bible, points to the future and says to the Israelites, God will revenge your enemies. You will be fully yet redeemed. And so 14 has a messianic quality in which there's the collage of the past, of God's might and distinctiveness, but it always points to the future. And again, all Psalms throughout most of Jewish history were read as pointing to the future, a messianic time. And now the description of the idols. And these are verses of Psalm 115, 4 to 11. They're not unique here, though there are subtle differences, and only two of the verses are identical, but they are a statement, a statement that God is the only real power, unlike the foreign gods who are but dolls, who are but sticks and stones. Idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. The mouth they have, and they do not speak. Eyes they have, and they do not see. Ears they have, and they do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouth. And now of the curse. And that is also Psalm 115, verse 8. Like them shall be those who make them, all who trust in them. And what is it to be like them? Impotent to be without any power. House of Israel, and now the culmination. House of Israel, bless Adonai. And now it's flipped. It's flipped in that it begins with the whole of the people of Israel. It began as if it was addressing just the professionals on the mount in the house of God. But now it's the broad circle that's going to go back narrow. House of Israel, bless Adonai. House of Aaron, bless Adonai. And here a distinctive um, line, because it is not in Psalm 115, which is, this is all much like 115, but house of the Levi. And that might underscore that this is a Levi engaging in this psalm, and to whom the Levi began his address. Bless Adonai, those who revere Adonai, bless Adonai. And that may go back to widening the lens again, all those who revere Adonai, which Radak understands as righteous Gentiles, Rashi, righteous Gentiles who were so righteous they converted, but a broader circle. And now the close. And this close, by the way, is part of our daily prayers. It's in the Mariv, it's in Pusuke de Zimra, the introductory lines, as is verse 13, also Pusuke de Zimra, as part of a prayer, Baruch Adonai Leolam, for verse 21. Blessed is Adonai from Zion who dwells in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. And so let me pull this together with the final comment, and that is both structurally and content, how is this relevant? First, for me, it's relevant to say that to praise God is to do so with context. It's to do it in a moment, praise is in a moment, but one gains by the collage of memory, of collective memory, 
to give context, to give context for a relationship, both as an individual, verse 14, not, not 14, verse kiani, verse 5. It, there is the individual, kiani, as for me, I know that great is Adonai, that our supreme is beyond all gods, which is to say, even in our day, what is it to have other gods? Abraham Joshua Heschel, our great teacher, said that an idol is substituting a means for an end, treating something less than the ultimate as if it was the ultimate. And that a religious mindset is the ability to make a distinction between means and ends, to know that money is a means, that power is a means, but that the end is to see the world through divine eyes. And to see the world through divine eyes is to see the world knowing, one, that all is possible and that it is goodness that is what comes out of all is possible. For ultimately, this is a psalm acknowledging God's goodness of having used power, the ability to affect change, to create a good world, to enable for redemption, and to enable communal responsibility. For that's what this leads to, community standing in the courtyard, praising God, knowing that the courtyard is the responsibility of the people to maintain and to do so purposefully. Little bit more yet to be said about how this is relevant, but now let me embarrass my friend, Rabbi Harold Kravitz a little, not too much embarrassment, but he's our honoree and I get such joy out of having friends join us to showcase my own project but also to learn together, because learning together is always a treat. And I began to learn with Harold in rabbinical school, in my first beginning of rabbinical school, as I think, Harold, you were my first Talmud study partner in Benzi Bergman's Talmud class. And so those who were particularly my formative study partners continue to be study partners, I, who I call Chavruta, Harold shares in common with me something that is rare and that he is also, I think, the only one in his class who has been in the same synagogue since graduation. Harold was one year ahead of me um, in rabbinical school, and that synagogue is in Minneapolis. And Harold started as the assistant in a big synagogue and became the lead rabbi pretty early for most assistants to assume the role of senior, where he's been the senior for many years. He's been the president of Mazon, the food charity. He will be the next president of the rabbinical assembly. And he is somebody who is very adept at making things happen. He is a doer. And it seems wonderful, Harold, to have a psalm that's about doing as what matters. Because Psalm 135 is about praising God for what God does, has done. But the notion here is it's not only what God done, did, it's that God is continuing to do and more pointing to the future about how God will yinachem. That word yinachem, by the way, which appears in the psalm in verse 14. For Adonai will judge God's people and upon God's servants will cause comforting, is how I translate it. But I circle the word yinachem. That's that quote of Moses from Deuteronomy 32, 36. But listen to how many different ways the word yinachem is understood. Will obtain satisfaction. That's Jewish Publication Society. Isaiah, Yenachem is to take revenge. For Radak, it's rescind punishment. For Adin Steinsaltz, take pity. 
for Rabinovitz and Slotovitz, it's bring comfort, which is to say, Noah has this quality of comfort, but also of revenge. You know, God also regretted. So it's to say the key verb of what God will do in the future is ambiguous, but it mostly in context points to promise of good, that things will be Noah restored. And back to my friend Harold with the charity work the larger missions of providing food for those in need of food on behalf of the Jewish community with Mazon. And it was Harold who was in charge of hiring the current co-chair, of hiring the current new head of the Rabbinical Assembly and United Synagogue as the head of that search committee. For that is your talent, Harold, and that is getting things done and doing so looking to the needs and to the future. And so I put you on the spot, Harold, after saying nice, all those nice things about any, you know, associations and hearing Psalm 135. I'll add one last comment. 135 is part of our Shabbat and Chag and Hoshana Rabbah readings. We read it every Saturday morning, traditionally in Psukei to Zimra. In that sense, it's familiar, but it's often the one that I omit. And so I was glad to learn it. Harold, any thoughts, any reactions to Psalm 135? Well, I just want to say thank you to my dear friend, Rabbi Eli Spitz. Uh, as you heard, we go back a long, long way. And uh, through all that time, Eli has been really a beloved friend and wise counsel and a a wonderful Hevruta. Um, I would just add um, also uh, Musar, a uh, Hevruta uh, for me in studying Musar, uh, which is about um, how we become our best selves. And uh, Ellie's uh, just a joy to watch you teach your community. And through the beauty of Zoom, uh, we're all able now to teach far beyond the borders of our congregation. Um, <laughs> The, uh, just the one comment I would just make, which is really striking, there's a, the section in which the psalm refers to idol worshipers as having mouths but cannot speak, they have eyes but cannot see, they have ears but cannot hear. Um, it's found uh, also, I think, in Psalm 113, which in the Hallel. And um, the person who I've heard teach about, use that verse most powerfully was both of our teachers, Rabbi Harold Schulweis, of blessed memory. And it was during a, um, a hearing, during the Iran-Contra hearings in the 1980s, he invoked that verse about those who were called to testify and who seemed to be completely, have like no ability to really uh, convey how they could possibly have gotten involved in the kind of misdoing that they were involved in. And I never forgot that teaching because um, that's what a good teacher does. They connect us to the text. And Ellie, you were such a teacher and uh, I'm delighted to call you my friend and my chavruta and, um, and to watch you do your thing and <laughs> public vote using the pandemic to get through the book of Psalms. Um, and I hope, uh, I look forward to hearing all the learning that comes from it and uh, when you eventually put this together for everyone to experience. So. Thanks, Harold. Thank you. So this image, I'll just underscore it um, as I pull together Psalm 135. And that is that image, as Harold mentions, is part of our holiday celebrations of Psalms, where in Psalm 115, we chant about how the idols are of the nations are but silver and gold the work and of human hands and what is often true in psalms is that a powerful image like that is taken out and applied in other contexts and i'm delighted harold by you remembering our teacher harold showweiss applying that image in our own time in a political context to say, you know, those who act deaf and dumb, um, despite having ears and eyes. And 
that they're like, you know, false gods. They are not to be believed in becomes a loaded image because it's it's not just about people. It's about gods. It's an echo across time. And that is the power of the study of Psalms. I read a book by a colleague of um, Harold's and mine's over Shabbat that was in my collection of by Paul Plotkin. He wrote it on his sabbatical. And what I found interesting about his book, The Lord is My Shepherd, Why Do I Still Want?, is he would take out lines from Psalms rather than analyzing a Psalm, but ways in which a line of Psalms continues to resonate in different moments in his life, which is to say to pull this together. It's a joy to study with you today, to honor my friend Harold Kravitz, to take the Psalm as a whole and see its artistry, ways in which it echoes the past but yet flows in a very distinctive way and chooses very decidedly what to quote outright, which is the words pointing to the future of hope specifically, and where to paraphrase, linking ourselves to something greater. That's the gift of Psalms, both continuity and at the same time, a distinctive voice. And so before I get ready to move forward with a distinctive voice, I see Shira for the first time as Kanner Shula holds her granddaughter, born in the course of our study of Psalms. And uh, you wanted to say hello because she knows you honored her four months ago. I did. It is a joy, Shira, to meet you. Maybe I'll have yes. the privilege of sharing in your naming one day. One but day, yes. It's nice to have Shira join our Shear. Absolutely. And together. I just wanted to show you that she is so grateful and delighted. Thank you. She's my hallelujah. Oh, absolutely. A great song.